good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome in from across the continent. My name is Jesse. I'm here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And if you're joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, as you may know, February is our entire month solely dedicated to the most amazing, awesome women in STEM on planet Earth. We have done this since our inception. We've kicked out all the dudes. We've got like 55 programs this month alone featuring some of the coolest women on planet Earth. We've had neuroscientists, cave divers, astronaut trainers. It has been a wild ride. Everything we do is on our YouTube channel. So if you want to check out more and keep the learning going, lots of opportunity to do just that. Now today I'm so excited too because we are continuing a little mini series we've got on the go with some really amazing space people. Uh, we are bringing back Dr. Caitlin Crawford and she is one of the most enthusiastic. Honestly, it's you know what, serious intro out the window, detachment aside. It's rare that I run across someone as enthusiastic as I am. It does not happen very often, as you can probably tell, and Caitlin fits the bill. She is a flight system systems engineer at NASA's Fable Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where she gets to help power spacecraft through the solar system, which sounds like a fake job, but is actually a real job, and it's very, very cool. So I want to say a big thank you, too, to our folks at the Western University Institute for Earth and Space Exploration. They've partnered with us on some incredible space programs all year long, and they've helped make our entire space series this year possible. So a huge kudos to them. I've got some more great resources to share on their behalf at the end of the broadcast. But without further ado, welcoming back one of my all-time favorite speakers, Dr. Caitlin Coffin. Thank you so much uh, for Hello. being here today. Hi. Hi. Thank you guys so much for having me. I love to be here. It is honestly a thrill every single time. I don't say this lightly. Like you are literally the example I use of when I we bring in new speakers and they're like, give us an example program. I'm like, Caitlin's program. Like, check it out. This is how pumped you can be about science. And like, I could never be that pumped about science. And then <laughs> you sort of set them up for failure. But yeah. I'm I'm honored. Um, sometimes it still also feels like my job is a fake job, but yep. I feel very fortunate to be able to to be able to do the things that I do and then also share it with all of you guys. Well, we're so appreciative you are. And I always like to note this. So I'm in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, and you're out in Pasadena, California. So I'm actually closer to North Africa geographically than you, which always oh, underscores the magic of these broadcasts. We've got a class live in Alaska, Miss Tomash's class. We've got our Oregon crew joining all over Ontario. So welcome into our audience. And Caitlin, I'm going to stop talking. If you want to bring up your presentation and blow our minds about the work you do, let's showcase a fake real job. <laughs> let's do Let's do it. You're too nice, Jesse. <laughs> all right. Share All right. the screen. Dun, dun, dun. Drum roll. The suspense. I know. Okay. I'm on the. I, I would be on the edge of my seat, except I'm standing today because I can't sit any more these two weeks after uh, seven. <laughs> Perfect. You are Take us away. Okay. Well, thank you all again for joining me, and thank you, Jesse, for that incredible, wonderful introduction. Um, as Jesse said, my name is Dr. Caitlin Crawford, and I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab out in Pasadena, California. So this is our beautiful lab. It always surprises people that there's mountains in the background. And honestly, it surprised me too when I first came. I didn't think Southern California had mountains like this, but we do. Um, so uh, we're going to go a little bit about me first. We'll talk about the work that I do, which includes spacecraft power and the specific missions that I work on now. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about how I got into STEM in my journey into how I got the job that I have and how I get to do the work that I do. Um, a fun fact about me is that I'm very short. I'm five feet. So uh, this is me at the Houston Space and Science Center um, trying to pretend to be an astronaut. And I am like actively on my tiptoes um, and didn't quite fit, but <laughs> we'll, we'll get there one day. <laughs> um, Okay, so a little bit about me. I grew up in a small town in Virginia. So that's where I was born and raised. Um, and then I went to undergrad in Virginia. And then ultimately I ended up getting my doctorate in material science at the Colorado School of Mines. And that's where I researched materials for deep space power. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in depth in a minute. But now, as Jesse said, I'm a flight system systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab out in Pasadena, California. So I've walked a little bit away from deep space power, and we'll talk about the work that I do today too, um, but it's really cool that I got to see both sides of the fence. So what exactly do I and have I done in STEM? So um, when I was a grad student, like I said, I was studying material science. What is material science? I know when I first started looking into it, I had no idea. I was just like, it's 
materials. <laughs> but the cool thing about material science is it takes all of the STEM disciplines, like physics and engineering and chemistry and math, and sort of together combines a way to describe materials. Any material that you see um, that with your eyes, like concrete or wood or metal, can be sort of described via science through this characterization of material science. So I, in particular, was a solid state physicist or a solid state chemist, um, and that looks at solid materials. You know, so if we were to, let's say, pick up a glass of water, we know that that's a liquid. Um, solid materials, much like, let's say, our phone, it's thick, it's hard, it has a structural shape. And in particular, metals can be made up of a network of repeating systems. And I want you to think about those things like Legos. And we, as material scientists, get to figure out how to make the most useful Lego set. So there are all these different types of materials that exist in the world, and they have these cool different little structures like Legos. So again, let's take our cell phone, for example. The front of our cell phone is glass, and the back of the phone is metal. So we have these two different materials that exist in this sort of common uh, material that we use. Now, when an engineer is designing this device, they sort of turn to material scientists and they say, hey, I need this thing to do a certain job. What material can we use? Now, this becomes a trade-off. So the phone, let's say, for this example, it's critical that we can sort of be able to see through it, right? We want the screen, we want it to be illuminated. We need it to be something called optically transparent. But then we have to trade off for how fragile it is. So if anybody who's ever dropped a cell phone knows, it can shatter. <laughs> I know I've shattered my fair number of cell phones and it's because the glass itself is fragile, but it gives us the property that we want. So material science is all about this balancing act of what do we need and what can we live with? So in the case of the phone, we needed it to be optically transparent, but unfortunately that means that it's fragile to mechanical stresses. But that's okay because it does give us the property that we want and we can live with a frowny face. <laughs> now we play this game for every material that we can think of. Now, whether that's cars, what could be spacecraft, houses, even Nintendo Switches. And in my case, it was the Martian rovers. So personally, I was a material scientist for space technologies. And in particular, I was looking at something called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator or an RTG. It's a big fancy word for the power systems and sources that allow us to power spacecraft for certain space missions, including the Mars rover. So this is the Perseverance Mars rover when it was getting built up at the NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab before it launched and headed to Mars. So this particular rover right now is on the surface of Mars collecting data. Um, and this thing, this thing in the back is the RTG, or the really long word, the radioisotope thermoelectric generator. And what this allowed us to do, this, this, this thing, was to generate power for the spacecraft. So like I mentioned, the Perseverance rover is now actively on the surface of Mars, taking pictures and collecting samples and understanding the terrain of the surface. But before it got there, we did have to build it up at JPL. And one of the subcomponents is this RTG. And inside the RTG, the RTG is made up of all of these different types of materials called thermoelectric materials. And that is a subsystem. And that means this, this subsystem uh, integrates into the larger system and allows us to be able to ultimately take photos of Mars. But these thermoelectric materials are the things that we were trying to design to be able to do this application. So what is a thermoelectric? It's a big word, right? So it's a class of semiconductors that can convert thermal energy into electric energy. And what that means is if we have heat, then we can convert that heat into electricity to power the spacecraft, to keep the spacecraft warm in the cold winters of Mars. Um, and it provides a reliable source of power in sun deficient environments. Now, I'm gonna let one of my colleagues explain it better. She made a YouTube video with NASA JPL who explains how RTGs and radioisotope power works. And I think she does a much better job than I. OK, 
Caitlin. I hate to stop yep. you. The audio is not coming through. So I, no. I know that's half the fun. Let me try and pull this up really quick and then I might be able to play it on my end. Uh, so the name is radio. Okay. Let me find this on YouTube for us. I can also pull off my headphones and I think that might help. So that might help. Let me know. You can try that. Okay. Okay. Let me do. You can queue it up again and we'll, we'll get it going. Sorry, folks, for a little delay. This is the fun. Something should go a little wrong in every video broadcast. Otherwise, uh, it's like, oh, you're muted, but we're going to get there. We're fine. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I can't hear you because you're muted, but we're going to we're gonna queue it up. I think it should work. In theory, maybe, kind of, sort of. I'm going to find it too on my end if I need it. Unmuted? You're unmuted. You're good. Okay. Let's see. Hey, we're golden. <laughs> Thank you. If you want to drive a rover on Mars, you have to keep in mind, there's no gas station for millions of miles, and there's no outlet to plug into for power. That's why NASA's Curiosity rover on Mars and other NASA spacecraft that explore the solar system use something called radioisotope power. A radioactive substance releases heat as it breaks down or decays. A system that converts that heat into electricity is called a radioisotope power system. These systems get fancy names. Curiosity's power system is called an MMRTG, Multi-Mission Radioisotope Thermoelectric Generator. MMRTGs are reliable and last a long time. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory is working with the Department of Energy on ways to make them even more powerful and capable. So researchers want to make the next generation of radioisotope power systems, the EMMRTG. The E stands for Enhanced. The new thermoelectric technology in development is based upon materials called scutcher rudites. They are a part of a family of compounds with many heavy atoms and complex structures. Scutcher rudites conduct electricity like a metal, but insulate against heat the way glass does. At the same time, they can generate sizable electrical voltages, just what engineers need to convert heat into electricity. Engineers use this material in devices called thermocouples, which are used to generate electricity. One of the thermocouples shoes is hot and one is cold. This heat transferred across a big temperature difference makes electrical charges flow from the hot shoe to the cold shoe and produces an electrical voltage. And this generates useful electrical power. If these materials were put in the same kind of generator that's on the Curiosity rover with some small tweaks, the generator could be up to 25% more efficient. After 17 years, a spacecraft could have 50% more power than with the current design. That means a spacecraft with an EMMRTG could fly longer and do more science during its lifetime. This kind of research could help us on Earth too. For example, some of the heat that gets wasted when you drive your car could be reused and put back into the car to charge the battery or power electronics. JPL is collaborating with leading U.S. material scientists to design and study even more advanced high-temperature thermoelectric materials. So next time you need to replace your car battery, think about how NASA spacecraft can't replace their batteries. But as we improve radioisotope power systems, they can go for longer and longer, powered by heat, even in the cold expanse of space. Okay. Voila. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like, we don't need to watch it twice. Okay. So the really cool thing is, is that like Saba described, if we make the materials better in a thermocouple, ultimately that makes the RTG better, which makes the Perseverance rover better, which means that we get longer, cooler photos on the surface of Mars. So it's our jobs as material scientists to try to discover what type of materials that we need to either create or discover to make that happen. And then we could have more efficient materials that lead to more effective missions. And the cool thing is, is that RTGs have been used in NASA for over 50 years now. So it's not just on Mars. My favorite missions 
maybe in general, um, are the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 missions, which are spacecraft that we've launched that are now well past the heliopause, which means that they have escaped our solar system and that they are just trucking along. And those guys were launched a long time ago and they're still being powered by their RTG. Also, they were used on the Apollo mission. So you can see a little RTG right here, which is a picture of the Apollo mission. And we got, we got to use them to take pictures of Pluto with our cute little heart shape here. So it's really cool that we get to use this type of technology to discover every facet of our solar system and universe. Now, there are other options when it comes to generating power in space. Sometimes an RTG isn't the right call. Maybe you're in an area that has a lot of sunlight. And when you do have a lot of sunlight, you could use solar panels. And there are some advantages and disadvantages when you're trying to decide what type of power source that you want. So in the case of RTGs, they're heavy, you know, they, they take up a lot of space. They're heavy little things. So solar panels themselves maybe are a little bit lighter and are more efficient when it comes to generating power that's coming in from the sun. So certain missions will pick solar panels over RTGs, for example. So it really depends on the objective of our mission and which way that we use our power sources. So we talked a little bit about spacecraft power. Now I'm going to talk about the work, the work that I do right now, which is the flight systems engineering work and the missions that I get to work on. So there are two missions that I get to be a part of, which is super exciting. The first one is called NISAR, which is NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar. In ISRO is the Indian Space Research Organization. So it's the organization, it's basically NASA of India. So it's this really cool partnership that we've come in with, with Israel to create an Earth observation satellite that uses radar, so that's the R in NISAR, to monitor topological changes of the Earth. So this is NISAR getting built up again in the high bay of JPL. And when we launch, we get to launch in May of this year, so we're coming up, it's crunch time. This spacecraft will go into orbit around the Earth and use this beautiful reflector that gets deployed in space and it will send signals down to the earth and that the earth will give signals back to the spacecraft and we'll be able to determine topological changes of the earth down to a couple of centimeters so this helps us determine you know, maybe the aftermaths of mudslides or earthquakes or natural disasters and see how land shifts underneath the trees, underneath clouds to say, how is our earth changing over a function of time? And what's really cool is that we get to see this globally. We get all of this information globally about our earth. So that's the first one. And like I said, that one, uh, launches in May of this year. So we're very excited and it's launching out of India. So on uh, one of the sides of India, it will launch, uh, I believe it's early May. Um, and we're just so excited to see this guy up, up in orbit. And then my second mission is Europa Clipper. So Europa Clipper launches this year as well. So it's a busy year um, and that launches in October. And Europa Clipper is an orbiter that we're sending to Jupiter's moon Europa. So Jupiter is this big planet all the way over here. Let's look at it and compare to Earth, huge guy. And it has a bunch of moons. And one of the moons that we're most excited about is Europa. And we'll talk a little bit more about Europa here in a second, but I just wanna mention that both of these spacecraft, NISAR and Clipper, are using solar panels. And these solar panels for Clipper have to be so big because we're so far away from the sun that we need a lot of sunlight. We need to capture a lot of sunlight um, when we're around Jupiter and we're headed to Jupiter in order to be able to power our spacecraft. So these are, the size of the, the solar panels, so they're these really big things. And so it's really cool that we get to see this mission powered by, by those solar panels. And because of our trajectory, the way that our spacecraft is going to Jupiter and the path it has to take to get there, that's what we call a trajectory, our spacecraft is gonna travel 1.8 billion miles to go answer questions. So far, B with a billion, it's just like unbelievable. So. I want us to take a minute and say, why Europa? Like, why are we going to this moon that's really far away? And I'll let them describe. Uh, just as a heads up, there's no talking during the video. It's just, uh, it's just a reading thing. Thank you. 
I think it's just absolutely amazing that we get to spend a space, send a spacecraft in the far spaces of the solar system, essentially to try to see if there's life. Like that's pretty much the whole point of this spacecraft. It's gonna ho hopefully help us answer some questions of, is there life on, in our solar system? Um, so it's this incredible mission that uh, teams here at JPL and at APL, because it's a joint mission as well, um, have been working tirelessly on for the last uh, couple of years, and we're so excited to send it to Jupiter. Um, and I can't wait. I really hope that we find evidence of life. And so like the video said, there's this, this uh, icy ocean that we believe exists under this crust of ice on Jupiter's moon Europa. And if there is this activity that we suspect that there is with these plumes, activity in a certain chemical composition, which we're going to go investigate, maybe that means that there's signs of life underneath the icy exterior of Europa. So the fract fractures and the fissions that they were talking about on the surface sort of implies that there's all of this ge uh, geological activity on Europa itself, which means if there's this geological activity like we have on Earth, maybe there's life. Um, so that'll be launching out of Florida uh, in October of this calendar year. So um, and a quick aside, now that I'm no longer looking at the material science of each of these individual missions, what I get to do for both NISAR and Clipper is to basically help us get to launch. So there's all of these different teams, there's material scientists, there's engineers, there's you know, managers that, that help us get spacecraft to launch. And what my job is as a flight systems engineer, it's sort of like the doctor of spacecraft. We come in every day and we're watching, you know, the really talented engineers who are building the spacecraft with like wrenches and hammers, not actually hammers, and create the actual mechanism. And then we come in as flight systems engineer and go, you know, is the spacecraft working the way that we hope that it will? And if it isn't, how do we fix it? And how do we make sure that it does work the way that we want it to work? So every day is a new challenge, and every day I get to hang out uh, and figure out what problems the spacecraft are having, like a doctor would, you know, if you're having like a cold or something. Um, so what is my path to where I got to today? So like I mentioned, I'm from a small town in Virginia. I uh, was Winchester, Virginia. Uh, we are most famous for apple orchards, and a lot of them, but it was really close to the Appalachian Trail, so I got to go hiking a lot when I was younger. And when I was in high school, I really wanted to be a fine arts major, which some would argue is very different than what I do now, um, with maybe a minor in chemistry, because science always interests me. But then when I got to college and I went to the University of Virginia, uh, I met somebody who was like, you know what? You really love space and you really like designing things. Have you ever thought about being an engineer? And I hadn't. And I was like, huh. You know, engineering is a lot of design. And so I argue that it's pretty similar. And so I ultimately transferred into the School of Engineering to study aerospace engineering, which is what I got my bachelor's in. So I graduated from 2015, uh, in 2015 from UVA with a bachelor's in aerospace. 
Um, and I got to do a lot of cool things when I went to college. I got to meet some astronauts. I got to hang out at NASA Langley out in Virginia and make some cool friends and learn some research and ultimately decided to go get my doctorate in 2015 to 2021 in material science engineering out in Colorado. So then I lived out in Colorado for a while and it was beautiful and mountainous. And then uh, in 2022, I got hired at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab to work on NICER and now Clipper as a flight systems, systems engineer. So this is where I get to be every day. I'm staring out at the mountains right now as we speak actually um, from our beautiful lab and I feel very lucky. But one of the lessons, a couple of lessons learned that I, that I would like to mention is that there's gonna be a lot of failure along the way, like a lot. Like I, when I went to college, I was certain that I was gonna do, do well as a, a minor in chemistry in college. And I just failed. <laughs> like I did not do well in that class and that's okay. You know, I now, especially in grad school, did a lot of chemistry too. And failure is an okay thing that will happen and don't get discouraged if you fail at something because Failure teaches you a lot of things, and I think it's really important to remember that. And a really important lesson that took me by surprise is that you don't have to be stuck behind a microscope to be a scientist or an engineer. Being an engineer allows you to do a lot of cool things. And for my job, I've gotten to travel a bunch and meet a whole bunch of exciting people and learn about incredible science and different, different ways of science. So don't think that you'll be stuck in a lab just because you're a scientist. So. Uh, one of the last things is that you are your biggest advocate, but there are some people along the way who are really going to help you. And knowing who these people are and helping find these people, they're priceless. So like I mentioned, when I went to college, somebody was like, have you thought about being an aerospace engineer? And that was my academic advisor, Catherine Thornton. And she happened to be an astronaut, which was super cool. Um, and then other people along the way have helped me, and I would be lost without them. So maybe listen to some peers. And then... Again, you don't have to be stuck behind a microscope to be a scientist. I love traveling. I love art still, so I still draw. Um, and I love backpacking and, and obviously talking to all of you guys. So with that, I'll open the floor to any questions about science, power, missions, anything. All of it. Well, thank you so, so much, Caitlin. Uh, as always, that was a wild ride. If you want to come out of screen share so you can see us again, have a bit of a conversation, we'll dive with Q&A. Uh, we've already got some great questions, so I'm just going to lead right into them. Our hey. Mr. Marsh crew, our Alaska folks, our, you guys have some amazing queries. How long did it take to build the RTG? Or in general, when we're building these things, is there like a timeline you can share with us or anything? Man, that is a great question. So um, there are many different parts of the RTG. So the inside, like Saba was talking about in her video, the inside is a nuclear core. Um, and that's made out of plutonium, plutonium-238. That gets created... Um, at the Department of Energy, and I don't know the rate of how long that takes, but I do know that that is a limited quantity. So we can't actually like pump out a bunch of these things because we're sort of limited to the number, the amount of plutonium that we have. Um, but all in all, uh, it does take a couple of years to create this RTG, um, especially when you think about when all of this research is going into trying to make an RTG better. You know, we would say when we were in my research lab, the materials that we were looking at, if we're trying to under like discover new materials, the materials that we're looking at today might go into an RTG 10 years from now because the material gets looked at and then the material has to get integrated and like tested in the larger RTG. And then that has to get tested into a spacecraft. And so it takes a while for the testing to make sure like, was that a good material? Yeah. Um, so it's not as fast as you might hope. <laughs> well, I'm really glad we talk about this. Almost every space program we do, we end up featuring the fact that like these missions take a decade usually at least to plan to execute everything else. So one of the nice things about that is that if you get involved with a project, you tend to be involved for a very long time, which is kind of cool that you have this this sort of science baby. You are working towards this in such a big, meaningful way to put it into the world. And it's why you see scientists to like overcome with emotion with something like perseverance lands on another world, because it's something that you've birthed and been involved with and come in day for day for a decade to make come to fruition. And, and you're contributing to this this deeper understanding of knowledge in the cosmos that's so, so meaningful. I did link to our YouTube class of uh, the Perseverance rover. There's some amazing stuff there. Check it out. The fact that we have a robot on another world exploring it will never get old. Like that is still 
unbelievable and amazing if you really think about it. Um, yeah, thank you for that answer. That was great. Speaking of going to other worlds, I mean, we covered this a little bit, but do, can you use this technology, like RTGs, everything, to go to other planets? Is this something both in our own solar system and I'll add as a little anyway, out of the solar system if we <laughs> wanted to, what that might look like? Okay, that's a fun question. So, so the short answer is yes, um, for at least internal to our solar system and slightly for outside of our solar system. So um, internal to our solar system. So we talked about how Europa Clipper has solar panels, but they were actually considering putting RTGs on that spacecraft instead of solar panels, but decided against it because um, it would have taken a bunch of RTGs, more than one. Um, to actually generate the power that we needed to. And anytime that we build spacecraft, we have to think about how heavy they are because we have to launch that into space. Um, and so they decided to go with the solar panel option because their efficiency and I assume that there was some weight analysis in there as well. Um, but then outside of our solar system, so I will say, uh, uh, no, I'm just saying so far, it's so far, I know. Oh, um, also an RTG used to take pictures of Pluto, right? So that's pretty far across our solar system. But then outside our solar system, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were sent outside of our solar system. But I will say the caveat there, so it could be done, but we didn't really know they were gonna last that long. Um, these missions, they have a, a life, life cycle, right? After X number of years, the power will unfortunately, much like a AAA battery, will go out. And Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are still sending us data, which is amazing and so cool. But if we really, really wanted to travel outside of our solar system and do very large scale exploration, we either might need to send more RTGs or maybe think of a different way to power it. Well, and so just for timeline too, because space is so big and I think that's really, like it's hard to really wrap your head around. So the moon takes like two, three days to get to, okay? Mars takes five to eight months to get to. The edge of the solar system was like 30 years for Voyager to get to. And at that speed, the next solar system over is like 70,000 years. So like, yes. Like it's, it's not, like it, they're totally different scales. It's almost unfathomable to think about how much more distant those are. They all look pretty close, but uh, not quite. So I'm really glad we got that question. Thanks, Caitlin. What's really crazy too, is that when we launch Clipper this October, yep. it's gonna take us six years to get to Jupiter. And so by the time we launch starts and then we get to Jupiter, I mean, you could go through college in that time. <laughs> I was say to the kids' perspective, we're going to be like old and gray by the time it's done. Not quite. Um, we've got a grade seven class. Ernest McMillan, welcome in, guys. At TDSB, have you ever been to space, and would you go if you could? I love this question. That is a great question. Um, so sadly, I have never been to space, but I would absolutely go. You know how cool that would be. You could see the curvature, and it would just be stunningly beautiful. Um, you know, I will say that. We live in a good age where maybe that could happen. You know, more and more people are going into space these days than ever before. So maybe it's possible. But I will say I'm pretty short, so they might have to design a new spacecraft, a spacesuit for me. <laughs> I've got to follow up to this because we talked about this with our, our first space program in this little mini series. Uh, okay, so space, yes. How about the moon or Mars? Where do you go to <laughs> anywhere? Would you go to all? <laughs> mm, that is a good question. You know. I think I would go to the moon, yep. but I don't think I would go to Mars. <laughs> so Cass Marion, who joined us yesterday, said the same thing. I, I got asked this the other day, so I agree. The moon we've been to before, it's going to be a huge challenge to go back. We're going the next couple of years. Like, it's wild. You kids are growing up in, like, the coolest era of space exploration ever in history, truly. Um, Mars will be the first time that we go. And it's going to be the longest voyage by far. There's going to be a whole ton of technical challenges. It will, frankly, be the most dangerous thing that we ever do in the history of space exploration. So it's a very different scale of thing um, than even going to the moon is as daunting and amazing as that is. And so this has been the common answer, which is interesting. So it's very scary. Also, like like Jesse mentioned, it takes a while to get to the to Mars, and yeah. I don't think that they would let me take my dog with me, and that would be really sad. <laughs> Oh, sad. Uh, partner and dog. Yeah, that's the big yeah. thing for sure. Um, we got another great question. So Europa, uh, scale of it. How big is Europa? 
we're going there. Europa Clipper is an amazing mission. Everyone should check it out. I'll send the link in the YouTube chat in a minute, but give us a sense of scale. That's a great question. So, so I'll start with Jupiter first. So Jupiter is so, so big compared to Earth. I don't remember how many Earths could fit inside of Jupiter, but it's many. It's many Earths could fit inside of Jupiter. Um, Europa itself is, I would say, much, much closer to the size of Earth. I think it is a little bit bigger, um, but don't quote me. But it's mean, This is like <laughs> one of those Googleable questions. And I like to yeah. get questions like this. It's, by the way, astronomers, roboticists, engineers do not go around with the superlatives in our heads all the time. It is These are tricky things. So I'm going to get some stats on Europa size in just a minute for everyone just to uh, fully answer that question. Uh, but and we'll take another. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, while Jesse's doing that, I think it's an Im important topic that Jesse just touched on. You don't have to know everything. Um, as an engineer, the, one of the cool things is I do get to Google things, you know? So there are fun facts that I may keep in the back of my brain, but there are other facts where I'm like, I'll just Google it. <laughs> so I, as you were saying that, Jupiter could fit uh, 1,300 Earths inside it. So over 1,000 times the size of the Earth. <laughs> Europa is about a quarter of the diameter of Earth, but has just as much water. So some of the other bodies in the solar system have just as much water as us, which seems kind of counterintuitive, but they're covered by a full ocean to a great depth. We know that. It's why we're going. Europa Clipper mission in the chat. Check it out. It's amazing stuff. Caitlin, we're nearing the end. We're going to take a few more questions to wrap up together. So if anyone wants to chime in more in the chat, our Ernest McMillan crew, we'd love to hear from you again. But we got a question about the team that you work with. How big? Uh, is the team that you work with? How many collaborators do you have in doing all this cool stuff? That's a great question. So every mission at NASA or at JPL can be different sizes. So there are bigger missions and there are smaller missions. Um, makes sense. Some some missions are more complicated than others. So Europa Clipper, for example, um, I would say my, um, I think Clipper itself is roughly a thousand people uh, who work on it on the lab. May, I think a little less. Um, the, the people that I interact with the most is roughly like, let's say a hundred people. So it takes a, it takes a village to get that into space. And then NISAR, it's a much smaller mission. Um, we're not sending something to Jupiter. It's still a very complicated spacecraft, but on the JPL side of things, it's maybe 200 people. So it's much smaller in scale. And it's really cool because that means for smaller missions, you get to, to wear many hats. You get to do a lot of cool things. Um, with bigger missions, understandably, there are people are more specialized and niched. Um, and on smaller missions, you have to know many things. Um, so it's really cool. And the teams, both teams are incredible and great. And JPL is JPLers are really beautiful to work with. Pretty great group. And we hear this every time we have the, uh, the chance to have folks from JPL on. Next week, by the way, we're having, uh, you know, Abby Craven. She's coming on to talk about Mars. Amazing follow-up broadcast. This, if you're so inclined for any of our kids. And again, everything is on our YouTube channel. So lots to see there. Um, Caitlin, I'm going to do a plug for some of our, our friends for a second, and then we'll wrap up with one big final question. I just want to note for our audience, I know we're getting near the end of the school day for some of you. Uh, do check out our Western University friends. They do so much to help uh, communicate science and STEM and space astronomy to kids. Uh, so they're a really amazing group. STEAM Labs is a, an incredible partner of ours for many years. Has some really cool robotic stuff if you're keen to sort of play around with the tools and technology that Caitlin's been talking about today. Some cool stuff at STEAM Labs. Mission Control Space Services is fantastic. And if you ever get a chance to go to an observatory if you're in london ontario cronin's the one i know we've got groups in oregon alaska today get a telescope and look up if you see the moon through a telescope it's a transformative experience if you see saturn's rings through a telescope it will change you it's like a dot with a line through it but it like holy you could actually see that the rings exist with your own eyes and not just in a picture from the gemini missions and that is it's so so cool so I uh, can't encourage you to do that enough. And on the note of getting inspired by space, Caitlin, is there a final thing you do to encourage our kids if they were keen on space exploration, robotics, material science, anything, what should they be doing now at grade seven, grade 10, whatever, to go out and explore and become you? <laughs> Man, that's such a good question, Jesse. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give two answers if that's okay. Please. The first answer is, What's really cool that I don't think that most people talk about is that it doesn't just take engineers to get things into space. It takes all sorts of professions. It takes 
lawyers, it takes designers, it takes engineers, it takes, um, you know, uh, business admins, it's, it, JPL employs so many different types of professions, and they are all critical when it comes to sending something into the solar system. And so just because you might not want to be an engineer, it doesn't mean if you're really excited about space, that you don't have to that you'd have to limit yourself, like come to JPL, work, work for me, work, you know, I would love to be for you to be my boss one day, and that'd be sick. Um, so don't don't limit yourself to just engineering if you feel really passionate about something, but also space. And then the second thing I would say, if you are really excited about engineering, um, one of the things that I wish that I got to learn when I was in high school or middle school, um, and I knew I was going to be an engineer, which I didn't, was coding. And coding is so important in our day-to-day uh, -day life here at JPL for the engineers. Um, and learning how to code and types of code is just, it can be fun. It's also like a fun puzzle. I love coding. Um, so if that does excite you, that's what I would recommend. There's some very cool options. We get, uh, it's funny, whenever we have NASA people on, they talk about this importance of diverse roles in cool things like this. If you're keen on deep sea stuff, Arctic stuff, space programs, there are so many jobs. Like you literally do not need to be a genius. You do not need to become a doctor like Caitlin, as cool as that may be, if that's your inclination. There are a bazillion things in it. You're the first person to ever say, become my boss. That's very funny. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, uh, and anyone who's keen on coding, I know the Canadian context because I am Canadian. So Kids Code Jeunesse, Canada Learning Code are two amazing organizations for that. And uh, for our U.S. friends, you can check out our YouTube channel. We had Gracie Ermi on the other day, uh, Coding to Save the World. It was a really cool program if you want to see some of her conservation work that she's done with coding, just as a, another option of careers with that as a, a skill set. Caitlin, before we wrap up, we've got a really quick question that's a, it's an easy one, but also could be impossible. We're going to find out. It is, what are your favorite planets or celestial bodies? Do you have favorites? No pressure. Oh, man, I mean, that's okay. So planets would be a tough one because I would have said Pluto, but Pluto got demoted. So that one was tough. Um, <laughs> that one, that one, really, that one really hit home when that happened. Um, you know, but I, I love Mars. Mars is the reason I got excited about space and thinking about this, just this planet that is so close to us, so different in so many different ways. So I would say Mars is a close second. And then third, which is a little bit of a uh, vague answer, there are hundreds and hundreds of exoplanets, aka planets that are not in our solar system. And it blows my mind that that can be the case. So just exoplanets as a concept are super cool. They are everywhere, and we're finding more every time. Every time we look, we find exoplanets. The universe is teeming with them, just like our solar system is. And that is amazing, and that's something that we've discovered in the last, like, 10 years, really. Yes. So, uh, again, kids, if you're keen on space, it's the coolest time to ever be interested in space or to want to be an astronaut or to want to be an engineer ever in human history. Go explore more. And if you don't want to do any of those things, just check it out because it's super cool, and you can tell people about it and share these programs. Uh, lots to uh, to check out if you're keen on all of this. Kayla, thank you so, so much again uh, for joining today. I can't thank you enough. Uh, kids, we really appreciate you being here. Your great questions and enthusiasm, too. And with that, we'll say farewell. Come join us next week with Abby Freeman and have a wonderful